I wanted to speak for a few moments here on this whole theme on redeeming your gift. That's our theme for this Christmas Day celebration. You know, many of us are familiar. Many of us are familiar with this whole concept of uh, redeeming a gift. Maybe you to redeem. You have to redeem your gift coupon, or your gift certificate, uh, or a gift card that you may have received. We are all familiar with these terms these days. And uh, maybe somebody, you know, sent you that gift, and uh, you know, you you need to do something uh, to redeem that certificate or that coupon. The fact is, somebody paid for that gift that came to you. Somebody paid for it. The entire price for that gift was paid. And uh, all you and I need to do is follow the instructions to redeem it. Maybe go online, maybe to Amazon or somewhere else and, and redeem your gift or go down to the store and redeem your gift so you can get uh, the, the reward, the gift that it represents. Of course, that gift was given because it was an expression of something. Most often it was an expression of love, sometimes of gratitude. Sometimes uh, they just want to celebrate a, a special occasion in your life. But there is, it is an expression of something. And there's a, there's a reason behind it. It's given most often because of love. And the next few minutes, I want to just share with us about God's big gift that He has made, He has made available to each one of us. This big gift that God made, has made available to you and me. And it's the whole reason and purpose and meaning behind Christmas. That's why we celebrate year after year this whole, the birth of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here this morning to celebrate God's big gift. I want to just read certain scriptures for us this morning as I, I take a few minutes to talk about God's big gift for us and just show us what God wants us to do to redeem that gift or to receive that gift for ourselves personally. The first scripture I want to read for us is from Romans 6 verse 23. Uh, for those of you who may be new who are not familiar, I'm going to make a reference to scriptures. You'll see them up on the screens on the side. Uh, the reference is simply the place where it's found in the Bible. But focus on the scripture text itself. The scripture text says, sin pays off with death, but God's gift is eternal life given by Jesus Christ of a Lord. So the Bible is telling us that God is giving us a gift. Today, God is giving you a gift. And it's the gift of eternal life that is made available to you and me through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's God's big gift that He has made available for all mankind, for all of us. And I want to explain a little bit on why this is so important. A little bit of background to why God is saying, I want you to receive this gift. Why, why is he making this gift available to you and me? What's the story behind this gift that is being offered to you? The Bible tells us, and I will do this as concisely and as quickly as I can. The Bible tells us, first of all, that all of us have a problem. It's the problem called sin. We have all sinned is what the Bible tells us. The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 23, all of us have sinned and we fall short of God's glory. So we fall short of God's standards for our lives. And that's all of us. There is no person who can say, well, that doesn't apply to me. In fact, in the Bible, we read, read about a particular incident where the religious leaders, they found a woman caught in adultery and they dragged her to Jesus, put her down before Jesus and said, Lord, uh, our master, they said, you know, according to our teaching, our religious law, a woman who's caught in adultery, there's only one recourse. She has to be stoned to death. What do you say we should do with her? Jesus paused at that moment. Here there was this woman. She must have been feeling so condemned, so terrible. And yet surrounded, surrounding her were all these religious leaders 
who seem to be so self-righteous as though, you know, they were perfect, impeccable before God. And Jesus just made one statement. He looked up to them and he said, Whoever of you has no sin, cast the first stone. And then he looked down on the ground and he continued to be writing something. We don't know what he was writing. What the Bible tells us is this. Starting from the oldest, one by one, they dropped their stones and they left. And Jesus looked up to this woman and he said, Woman, where are your accusers? The point is this, that if we truly, honestly examine our lives, none of us can say, I am without sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then our sin, whether small or big, whether few or many, our sin has consequences. The Bible tells us that our sins in Isaiah 59 verse 2, your sins are your roadblock between you and your God. That's why he doesn't answer your prayers or let you see his face. Sin has an impact on our lives and on our relationship with God. It becomes a roadblock, an impregnable wall, a barrier that com disconnects us completely from our Creator God. And all of us innately desire to connect with God. All of us desire to connect with our source, the purpose and the meaning of our lives. We desire for that. But yet this problem of sin becomes this barrier that separates us from God. Now, of course, many of us make our valiant attempts to break past this wall. We somehow want to reach God. We try through our own religious works, our good deeds and so on. In many different ways, we try to reach God. It's our attempt. But here stands this wall, this roadblock of sin. There are numerous other consequences. The Bible makes it very plain and clear that because of sin, there are all other conditions and problems like sickness and disease. Uh, all other things came into this world. They were not originally brought in here by God, but they came in because of sin. But the ultimate price of sin, Romans 6 verse 23 says, sin pays off with death. This death is not just physical death. But it's an eternal separation from God in hell. God is infinitely holy. And we, in our sinful state, cannot even enter His presence. So we are banished forever because of sin from the very presence of God in hell. Sin pays off with death. Now, finding ourselves in this predicament, what is the way out? How do we connect with God? How do we reach God? The point is this. The Bible makes it clear that none of us can save ourselves. As I mentioned earlier, many of us are trying to reach God. We try in various ways to reach God. We go on pilgrimages. We sometimes surmise that maybe our, our good deeds can account for our misdeeds. And we think, you know, for every misdeed, I will do five good deeds. Some of us increase the stakes, ten good deeds. And maybe all of that, the accumulation, the sum total of my good deeds versus my misdeeds will somehow help me break through this barrier and help me connect with God. But the Bible tells us this. In Isaiah 64 in verse 6 it says, We are unfit to worship you. Each of our good deeds is merely a filthy rag. We dry up like leaves. Our sins are storm winds sweeping us away. Each of our good deeds is merely a filthy rag before an infinitely holy, absolutely perfect God. So somehow, our own good deeds will not be able to account for this problem of sin. You know, there are some of us who say, well, maybe 
I'll find another way out. Maybe some other human person who's lived a noble life, who's done a noble thing or done many noble things, maybe he or she can become my way to God. And we tend to put our faith and confidence in some other feeble, fallible human person, thinking that they can bring us to God. But the Bible tells us this very plainly in Romans 3 verse 10. No one is acceptable to God. No one. No human person. No matter how good, how well lived their life may be, they do not have the capacity to save any other person. Because each person has to pay or account for their own wrongdoing, for their own sins. So the point I want us to understand is this. That we need a savior. Each one of us needs a savior. We stand before God with our sin, separated from God's presence, unable to save ourselves, no other human being who can help us, and in need of a savior. If we are to die in this condition, we are going to be eternally separated from God in hell. And this is where God himself stepped in. The Bible tells us so plainly that God loves us so much. He came to be our savior. You see, our sin had to be paid for. God couldn't just turn a blind eye and say, I will absolve you of all your guilt and all your sin. Just come on in. He can't do that. He's a, in as much as he's a God of love, he's also a God of justice. God is a God of truth and grace. But truth and justice demands that sin has to be paid for. Sin has to be atoned for. A life has to be given in order for sin to be paid and for the sinner to be forgiven. And since none of us could do that for ourselves, the Bible says God loved us so much that he came in to pay the price on our behalf. And this is who Jesus Christ is. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into this world. God, the eternal God, the infinite God, chose to confine himself to a mortal body. And he came into this world. The Bible tells us in John 3 verse 16 that God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God loved us so much that he came into this world so that he could pay the debt that we owe. The Bible says there in Romans 5 and verse 8 that God showed how much he loved us by having Christ die for us even though we were sinful. This was an expression of God's love for you and me. God said, I know you can't save yourself, but I'm going to take care of the problem. I'm going to come in and pay your debt on your behalf. That's what happened on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the full price. Imagine a debt that you and I could never pay. Now in, the, in, in our everyday life, if you and I owe the bank a huge amount of money, or you owe some other person a huge amount of money, you know the stress. You know how heavy that burden is on your mind. Day after day you, you go to sleep, you wake up thinking of that. It's a tremendous pressure. And what a relief it is when somebody steps in and pays off that debt in full on your behalf. Now something infinitely greater happened. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid our debt in full. The Bible tells us in 1 John verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2, Christ is the sacrifice that takes away our sins and the sins of all the world's people. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter you're rich or poor, educated, uneducated. It doesn't matter any of that. It doesn't matter which nationality or which ethnic background you are. Jesus Christ died for you and he paid your debt in full. When he died on the cross. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. The Bible says Christ died once for our sins. 
An innocent person died for those who are guilty. Christ did this to bring you to God. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he pay for our sins? So that through his sacrifice, through his death, we could go to God and receive forgiveness for our sins. And we could now be connected with God. This barrier of sin could be taken out of the way. And we could now enter in to a wonderful relationship with God. Jesus did this, the Bible says, to bring us to God. So God offers salvation as a free gift. After Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us he was buried. Three days later, he rose up again. He ascended into heaven. And he is seated there as God, as king, as, as glorious as, as he ever was. And today, he's making salvation available to you and me freely as a gift. We, the same words that we read at the very beginning, sin pays off with death. But God's gift is eternal life given by Jesus Christ of the Lord. God is giving you a gift this morning. It's the gift of eternal life. It's the gift of salvation. It's the remedy for sin in our lives. He's giving that as a free gift for all of us. Romans 5 verse 18 says, Everyone was going to be punished because Adam sinned, but because of the good thing that Christ has done, God accepts us and gives us the gift of life. Because of what Christ has done, God is ready to accept you and to give you this gift of life. What I want to point out is this, that salvation is a comprehensive gift, meaning it doesn't address just one aspect of our problem. It's not just forgiveness of sins, but salvation, the gift that God offers you and me this morning, deals with every aspect of our need. It brings forgiveness for our sins. It restores our relationship with, brings us into a relationship with God. It, it deals with sickness, with disease, with demonic oppression in our lives, with any other bondage that we might find ourselves in. Everything that sin caused in our lives, God's gift of salvation addresses in our lives. So when you and I receive this gift, it's a comprehensive gift. It deals with every problem that you are facing in your life. It's not just, okay, I wipe, you, wipe your slate clean kind of a deal. It's something that says, I will take care of your whole life. Here on, uh, onwards into eternity. It's a complete answer from God. That's the gift that God offers you and me. Jesus captured this for us in this wonderful story that some of us may be familiar with, the story of the prodigal son. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of the two sons said, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. I want to, just, I want to use it. And so the father handed him his share. And this young man took the wealth that he received. He disappeared into a far country. And then he just enjoyed his life. And he spent all that he had on riotous living. Just spent it all. And then one day when he woke up, he realized he had nothing left. His life had come down to a zero. And the friends who hung around with him disappeared. And his only option was to go find some sort of work. He was actually working with the pigs. And he reached such a low state in his life, he would have barely eaten the food that he was feeding the pigs. And one day, he came to his senses. And he said, you know, even the servants in my father's house have a better deal. Maybe I should just go back to my father and just tell him that I have sinned against him. I've sinned against heaven. And if he was willing to accept me, I'm willing to be like one of the hired servants in his house. And so he mustered up enough strength and he made this long, tortuous journey back to his father's house. And Jesus narrated this. He said, when the father saw his son Away off, far away. 
The father didn't wait for the son to walk all the way to the door. He ran. He embraced his son. And he kissed him. Now you just have to imagine this. This son must have been in tatters. He probably hadn't had a bath for months. No clothes, no pair of clothes to change. And then he must have had all, you know, an overgrown beard and hair and all of that. And smelling, stinking, living with the pigs. Here comes his father. Embraces him. Kisses him. And the son utters those words that he probably rehearsed a thousand times. Oh, Father, I have sinned against you and heaven. I am not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And Jesus said, all the father did was he brought him in. He called his servants and said, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring sandals for my son. And let's kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. The father didn't even bother to respond to the offer the son made. That's not even in the picture. There are four important things Jesus, that we can point out from the story that Jesus gave. But if we return to God, there's one. Our relationship will be restored. God is not interested in your past because you know really, as far as God is concerned, Jesus Christ has already paid for it. He's not even going to bring it up in the discussion. He doesn't even want to talk about it. All he's waiting for you is to come to him. Number two, we see that the son is completely accepted just the way he is. The father embraces him, kisses him. He says, I accept you. You are mine. God Almighty wants to let you know that he's waiting to accept you. You are accepted because of what Jesus Christ did. Number three, we see the father letting the son know that he is extremely highly valued. Here was a son who had spent everything and yet the father says, bring on the best robe. Bring the ring. Bring the sandals. This son is worth it. He's valued. And number four, he's honored. Who are we going to celebrate today with a fatted calf? He says, we're going to celebrate my prodigal son because I want to honor him. He's honored. I want you to know that the God of heaven highly values you. He honors you. He invites you to come back to him and see that relationship restored. To know that you are accepted. To know that you are valued. To know that you are honored in his eyes because Jesus Christ paid for everything. There's nothing more you and I need to do. God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans 8 verse 32, God did not keep back his own son, but he gave him up for us. If God did this, won't he freely give us everything else? What else do you need in life? Forgiveness uh, other than just your relationship with God being restored. What else do you need? Healing for your body, deliverance from your bondage, a solving of your life issues. God will freely give us all things is what the Bible says. So this morning, as we get ready to close, I want to ask you, would you like to redeem your gift? The God of heaven is offering you a free gift. The gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. The price has been paid. Your debt is cleared. Your gift is waiting to be redeemed. All you've got to do is to come to Jesus Christ and place your faith, your trust, your confidence, your life in his hands. Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 30, verse 30 and 31, records a man who asked this question, what must I do to be saved? The answer the apostles gave, have faith in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. This is also true for everyone who lives in your home. What must I do to be saved? Have faith in the Lord Jesus. The Bible tells us very plainly in Acts 4 verse 12, only Jesus has the power to save. His name is the only one in all the world that can save anyone. We're not asking you to join a religion. We're not asking you to join this church. We're not asking you to change your name. We are inviting you to believe in the only one who can save. 
the only one who has the power to save because he is the only one who paid for the sins of the whole world. He is the only one who was qualified to do that. He is the only one who rose up from the dead and who is alive today. He is the only one with the power to change our lives. Only Jesus can save. His name is the only one in all the world that can save. I want to just remind you once again. God is not asking for anything other than you coming as you are. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 verse 8, You were saved by faith in God who treats us much better than we deserve. This is God's gift to you and not anything you have done on your own. God is not asking you for money. God is not asking you to go on some pilgrimage. God is not asking you to do a thousand good deeds. He's not asking you to sacrifice this or that. All he's inviting you to do is to have faith in Jesus Christ. And salvation, God's gift will be yours uh, without you doing anything. And so the, the apostle remarks, thank God for his gift that is too wonderful for words. I've tried in these simple words of mine, in a few moments, I've tried to explain to you this great big gift God is offering every person. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, this gift is available to you. Will you receive that gift this morning? What you have to do is to tell Jesus that you are putting your faith in Him. The one who died for your sins, who was buried, who rose up again, who is alive today, who is God eternal, is waiting to hear that prayer from you. And if you will talk to him this morning and say, Jesus, I believe in what you did for me. And I'm putting my faith in you right here this morning. I'm putting my faith in you. And from this day on, I'm going to walk as a person who has his or her faith in you. If you will pray that, if you will express that, that gift is yours. That gift of eternal life. And it's available to each one of us. As we saw in the musical this morning, the closing words, Ataman hears this. He says, is it you? The one I've searched for all these years. And he hears the voice of the Lord saying, yes, my son, it is time for you to receive my gift. The gift I died to give you and all the people of this world. I want to invite you to just bow our heads for a few moments. I would like to lead us in a simple prayer. I know many of us have already received God's gift of salvation. And yet there could be some of us here. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this message from the Bible of God's free gift of salvation. Maybe you never knew up until now that salvation was available freely in response to you placing your faith in Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life and to be your Savior. And this morning, you would like to do that. Your search has ended right here, right now. If you this moment will put your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And I want to help you do that. I'm going to say a very simple prayer. This prayer is just an aid. It's just to help you express your faith in response to what you've heard. This prayer is just to help you express your faith in Jesus Christ. That you desire to do this and receive God's free gift of salvation. If you would like to do this. I would like you to please say this with me. If you've never done this before. Or for some reason you feel the need to do it again. Would you say this prayer with me? 
out of the sincerity of your own heart because you are choosing to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you say this with me? Lord Jesus, I believe you rose up again and you are alive today. Forgive my sins and I receive your gift of salvation. I receive your free gift. Come into my life and help me follow you the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.